between the Dali Museum and the University. Um, this idea was dreamed up uh, by Executive Director Hank Hine a couple of years ago, and he and I had lunch one day, and we were talking about ways in which we could partner in the two institutions closer together. And wouldn't it be nice if the Dali Museum could become a platform for highlighting the excellence that is taking place in the scholarly community, which is right next door? If you have not been to the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg recently, I would encourage you to do so. It's a fabulous little university, about 6,500 students, and we're going to grow over the next couple of years to about 10,000, and that's part of our strategic plan. And uh, what that means in terms of growth of the downtown area is tremendous. And the business community loves it, and developers will love it, but it's going to be very interesting to see what's going to happen over the next couple of years in terms of the growth, in terms of program development, the partnerships that the university has with our um, this weekend is move-in, and uh, our faculty, I have to thank them ahead of time for taking time out of their schedules to come here tonight because they've had full days of meetings today, full days of meetings tomorrow, there's graduate orientation tonight, freshman convocation on Sunday, move-in day on Saturday and Sunday, and faculty are expected to be all, of the, all those things and then be there bright-eyed on Monday morning as well. So thank you ahead of ahead of time for joining us tonight. So the Genius Next Door is an event, uh, kind of like inside the actor studio, it's a showcase of faculty. And we do this about once a month in the fall semester and the spring, spring semester as well. We take a break then in the summertime. And I often have a total of three faculty on stage. We, we have a dialogue about the research and uh, about them personally. But tonight we're going to try something different. I'm going to have two. What I have found over the past year is that we've been run out of time. So just when it's getting good and the, fact, and the, the audience is asking questions, it's time, it's time to go. So we're going to try it tonight with, with two faculty members to allow us to dig a little bit deeper into some of the questions, allow a little bit more uh, audience participation as well. So with that, let's get started with the Genius Next Door. Thank you. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't expect that. Thank you. So let me begin by introducing our first genius to my immediate left, Dr. Veryl Cahan. Dr. Cahan is an assistant professor of information systems in the College of Business at the University of South Florida, St. Petersburg. In this role, Dr. Cahan teaches courses on information technology and business intelligence, and he conducts research about the use and impact of technology on our lives. Some of Dr. Cahan's research interests include online privacy, organizational knowledge, repositories, the use of technology to support and in some cases supersede human decision making. Currently Dr. Kay is engaged in research to better understand why it is that we as a society have been so lured by the internet and that we have fallen prey to and have all but failed to fully protect our privacy on the world wide web. Verrill earned his bachelor's of science degree in mechanical engineering in Turkey and through a twist of fate, he ended up working as a bookkeeper in the accounting department of a multinational bank in Turkey. After realizing that he wasn't really passionate about general ledgers, Dr. Cahan um, uh, had an opportunity to move to the United States to continue his education. This time, it was in information technology. And after receiving his PhD from the University of South Florida in Tampa, he joined USF St. Petersburg in 2010. When not in the classroom or engaged in his research, you will likely find Dr. K. Hill working in his garden. Having lived in urban cities for most of his life, he claims that he has just discovered the joys of the soil and of growing his own herbs and vegetables. And he also likes to read mystery novels and history books, and if all goes as planned, he says, one day he's going to write his own mystery novel, but only, oh, if he had the time. Welcome. Thank you. To Dr. Kale's left is Dr. Mark Walters. Testing the boundaries of college admissions committees, Dr. Mark Walters earned his bachelor's in English from McGill University, Canada, his master's in journalism from Columbia University, and his doctoral degree in veterinary medicine from Tufts University, Boston. <laughs> Why the laughter? Yes, <laughs> I'm used to it. <laughs> <laughs> Why the confusion? So if you're having difficulty connecting the dots, so is his dean, I tell you. <laughs> A close friend once said that Mark doesn't follow his own drummer, he follows his own interstellar frequency. 
While most children his age were satisfied with a pathetic little county fair goldfish, Mark successfully bred various species of tropical fish and birds in his basement. And when he was in the fifth grade, Mark claims to have built a beehive in his bedroom. Can you imagine? <laughs> Later in life, before settling into the exciting life as an academic, Mark worked as a bartender in Maine on a lobster boat in Nova Scotia, as a deckhand hauling tow along the mighty Mississippi. As a reporter, he has flown to the far ends of the Aleutian Islands on a Hercules C-130, traced illegal animal smuggling routes from Argentina and Brazil into Europe and into the United States. He's traveled to all 50 states and throughout Canada and Europe, as well as to Africa and Asia. But coming back closer to home, Dr. Mark Walters holds the title of full professor of journalism and media studies, and he's a director of the new fully online program in digital journalism and design at USF St. Pete, a topic I hope he spends some time on tonight. He's written five books, and he has been reviewed in the New York Times, the New York Review of Books, in Nature, and many, many other publications. Welcome, Dr. Walters. So, Vero, we know a little bit about you. We know that you were born and raised in Turkey. Yes, I am. And that you emigrated to the United States. Yes. Where I believe you've been ever since. Yes. Take us back in time to your days growing up in Turkey. What was that like? Absolutely. Well, let me let me um, start from um, well, let me backtrack like forty years or so, pushing forty. Can't believe it. Um, born and raised in Turkey, grew up in Ankara, the capital of Turkey. Um, urban city, just like New York City, crowded, a lot of buildings, no knowledge of backyards. I didn't know backyards existed. And um, joined um, the University of Mi Middle East Technical University, got my undergraduate degree in mechanical engineering. So difficult. A lot of math. We were just talking about it a couple minutes ago. A lot of math. I said, mm, do I really want to do this? It is just too messy to, be, to, 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 to start with. Um, and I said, maybe there's another option for me out there. And I ended up joining a multinational bank in Istanbul. A mechanical engineer working at a bank. Unimaginable. Um, but what I was doing was, I was doing a lot of process um, re-engineering. We were just tracking processes, tasks inside the bank, and see if we could um, increase efficiency and effectiveness. So redesign all the tasks, all the processes inside the bank. Um, that's what I did for about four years. And they said, well, um, thank you for your services, but we think uh, we want to downsize now and we want to close this department. And I said, uh-oh, what are we going to do now? They said, we really like you. We don't want to fire you. So instead, what we want to do is give you a job in the accounting department. Would you accept it? Well, um, you have two choices. On the one hand, you have unemployment. <laughs> On the other, you have a job in the accounting department. And guess which one I picked? <laughs> accounting department. So a mechanical engineer ends up in accounting bookkeeping, general ledger, never heard of it before in my life. <laughs> so every morning I start with the general ledger, import it into Excel, do a lot of math, copying and pasting, um, and create a lot of reports. I said, okay, well, this is fun, but I did that for two months, and I'm like, mm, this is not so much fun. <laughs> this is so routine. What am I going to do with this? So it was taking me two to three hours, I think, to do um, the, the first set of tasks I had to do in the morning. And then I created a, a lot of macros in Excel. I don't know if you're familiar with macros in Excel. They kind of automate uh, what you can do. Copying and pasting and importing data, um, you can automate that process. So I had eight buttons in Excel. And in the morning, I would come and click those eight buttons, and they would do everything for me. <laughs> and I saved up three hours. The whole set of tasks I had to do in three hours, 
now eight buttons were doing those. And I was just surfing the web. <laughs> I'm not joking, I was surfing the web. Um, and then I had um, really good um, supervisors at the time. One of my supervisors was, um, he was so knowledgeable. He knew everything. Yeah. He would um, go to the Turkish version of Jeopardy and he would win a lot of money there. And they would call him up for those types of challenges, um, for trivia, and he would know everything. And I said, at some point, I want to be like him. Um, and in the meantime, I had an also a different IT manager. He saw my Excel spreadsheets. He said, he said you have the potential here, so you, could do, you should do something about this. Um, and I could just last only one year in the accounting department. I said, well, there are two things I want to do. Number one, I want to be like my boss, know everything. Number two, I want to be good at this computer stuff. So what should I do? What should I do? Came here 10 years ago to join the master's degree in MIS and Management Information Systems in Tampa, USF Tampa. Um, the first year I'm there, um, studying, I'm enjoying, oh, this is really this is really good, this is what I want to do. The next thing I know, um, my professors tell me, hey, you want to join the PhD program? I'm like, what? What is that? <laughs> I had no idea what I was getting myself into. Fast forward five years, I'm teaching at USF St. Pete. <laughs> um, graduated from USF Tampa, got my PhD in Management Information Systems, and um, I'm happy to be here now, enjoying every bit of it. Have you been uh, back to Turkey? <laughs> Have I been back to Turkey? Yes, a few times. Um, usually, my family comes here and visit me. My brother is already in here, not in Tampa, in Seattle. I mean, I'm sometimes joking, this, we couldn't be further apart. It's just diagonal. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm in Florida, you're in Seattle. Um, but my mom and dad come and visit me. They visit my brother too. So um, not, I'm not homesick as much. But you know, every now and then I try to go back and enjoy the food. <laughs> the food is unbelievable. I wish we had the same type of restaurants here. Uh, the Middle Eastern restaurants here and the, the, the Greek restaurants, um, they really don't cut it. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> they really don't. So I'm homesick on that front, yeah. but on the family front, no. I'm, I'm, I consider myself really lucky. Very good. Well, thank you very much for that. So, Dr. Walters, there was a chuckle in the audience when we outlined your circuitous route, fascinating route from English to journalism to veterinary medicine. Fascinating. Take us back in time. We know that you had some very interesting childhood experiences, grew a beehive in your bedroom, and uh, actually made it fish. Tell us about that. Well, it's kind of poignant for me to be here because, given the title of this program, because I failed first grade. <laughs> I was a terrible school phobic. I couldn't learn anything when I did manage to go. And how many of you remember the Cold War? When I was in kindergarten and first grade, it was during the Cold War. Um, this was in the mountains of Western North Carolina. And going to school was scary because you didn't know if a bomb would be dropped that day. Now, not everybody felt like that, but for me, it was an intense fear. For example, we used to have drills where you know, the nuns would say, OK, we're going to have a, a nuclear drill. And they would say, this is what you do. Well, as soon as they rang the little brass bell on the desk, you know, signifying that a bomb was about to hit, in my mind, it was real. And I used to jump up in the classroom, and I'd run out the door and all the way about six blocks home. <laughs> and I had a routine, and I used to count how long it would take me, thinking I would have you know, so many minutes before it hit. 
And time and time again, the second time it happened, you know, they said, this is a drill. She rang the bell, and I yelled, and I was gone. The third time or fourth time, they had the priest come up and guard the door. <laughs> so she said, okay, the bomb has been dropped. And I had already in my mind somehow figured out multiple exits. So I quickly <laughs> went out the window. And my plan was to go by a pool at what was called the Elks Club on a hill. And if I didn't make it home, I could jump in the pool. But my mind was racing, and then I realized, well, no, the water would have evaporated by then. And I wouldn't, so I would have to try to make it home. But my point is, is that there was a lot going on in my mind besides schoolwork. And I had such a difficult time that um, most of the time I spent at home, I immersed myself in all sorts of fascinating projects. When I was seven, I raised honeybees. And those of you who know honey, I used to love sourwood honey, which we get back home in the mountains you know, in, the, uh, in the spring. And one day I decided, well, wouldn't it be neat to have a hive on my wall? So I managed to um, take one frame. Those of you who've seen inside of a hive know that there are 10 or 12 frames. Well, I took one and built a wooden case and a, a glass front and drilled a hole in the top of it and ran a, a little connector out the wall. And so you could see the bees come through with a pollen on their legs. And I marked the queen with some bright nail polish. You could see her in the upper chamber called the super. And it was a fascinating thing. And I could hear them at night buzzing. And it was like music to me. And then one day, they got confused. And instead of going into the, the pipe out the wall, they for somehow they all swarmed and went into the dryer vent. <laughs> and my dad happened to be drying his t-shirts. Oh, no. So he uh, went and pulled it out and put it on, and we heard a lot of stomping around and yelling. <laughs> but you know, they didn't close me down. He said, I just want you to mark that. He said, maybe if you put some big symbol around it, they'll, they'll see it. Well, it didn't happen again. So you've got to give them credit. Not a lot of parents would do that. Um, did I mention I come from a family of 11 or 12? Kids? I think they were 12. <laughs> Adding to the chaos. And my parents were very, very different. My dad had a fourth grade education, came from a very poor family um, in Georgia. My mother went to a fine college, Rollins, for two years and came from a, a much, much more well-to-do family. So you can imagine what a culture that was. So 12 kids, very, very different um, parents, an atom bomb that could drop any day, <laughs> and the 12 kids. And life was utter chaos. So I think I must have found my surcease in claiming a large closet in the house, this two-story house in, in near Asheville, the town of Hendersonville, North Carolina. And uh, that became my menagerie. It became my dark room. It became everything. It's where I would go. I would wake up. I had a developed film in there. I had my fish. I raised some hard, you know, angelfish, for example, zebra fish, neon fish. Um, had all sorts of, of birds. And that's not to mention the gerbils and hamsters and all sorts of things. But they pretty much had run out of the house. <laughs> but it was a hard time. The only place I learned was really at home. And back then, they didn't use the, they didn't have polite terms like the learning disabled. They freely used the term retarded, as some of you remember. Well, that's pretty much how I was, was classified um, throughout that time, unable to learn in school, until finally they decided I needed to go um, into a remedial setting. I don't know what they would call that now, but it wouldn't have been a happy place. But that's, that's a different story we'll get to. Fascinating background. So what was the moment? Because you are now a professor of journalism and media studies. You're the director of the fascinating online program, Digital Journalism and Design. 
somebody must have come into your life, showed you opportunities, became a mentor, a friend. What was that aha moment that you said, you know what, I think this is what I want to do. I want to go into this, this line of work. Well, in sixth grade, they decided I needed to go be institutionalized of some sort where I could learn. They sent me to a psychiatrist, and I'm getting to your question. His name is Dr. Sorky. I remember him so well. He had a little house by a lake in the country. And they said, well, he needs testing, so see what he needs to do to move on in his life. So he interviewed me. We talked a few times. He gave me a lot of tests. And one day my mother said, Mark, they want to put you in a, school, a gifted school. So he talked them into it. The psychiatrist met with him and said, look, why don't you give this kid a chance? He, he can't be as stupid as you say. He just can't be. Look what he does. And the headmaster there at Gibbons Hall in Asheville gave me a chance. And in seventh grade, I was called to the front of the class. I'm getting to your question about somebody who really changed my life. We had been asked to write essays. And so Mrs. Hutton was her name. And to this day, I remember the kind of wool, rough, purple gray sweater she wore. I can remember the smell of it when I walked up beside her. I said, OK, here we go again. Walters, the village idiot, is going to be dragged to the front of the class and humiliated again. So I braced myself for her to say what I'd been told all my life. But instead, she said, Mark, she said, would you read your essay? And I looked at her. I said, can't we do this in private? Can't you just tell me what's wrong with it? Why are you doing this to me? <laughs> She said it was the best essay in the class. And I remember it was called what we call freeways, because the interstate highway system was being built way back then. And I was talking about the cost of loss of the blue highways and traveling high speed and missing those small towns. And I read it. And the class just was silent. And she said, Mark, that's one of the most beautiful essays I've ever heard. It was that moment I think two things happened for me. Is I knew I wanted to be a teacher. You had a mentor. I wanted to be like her. And secondly, I knew I wanted to be a writer. And with that confidence, I went on to um, a private boys' school, a good boys' school. Um, and I actually got into college. And my second year of college, um, I was at McGill, and I happened to be back in Hendersonville, and I met by then a teacher who had grown quite old, but she remembered me. And she said, Mark, she says, what are you doing these days? I said, I'm in college. And she looked at me, and she said, she said, that's a miracle. <laughs> <laughs> And I went on. I then went to graduate school at um, Columbia University. It's very difficult because I didn't deserve to be there any more than I deserved to be here. Um, and then I went on uh, for an advanced degree because I loved animals. They were always my best friends, from bees to fish to hamsters. Um, and that became really the theme of my, of my writing and my career as a journalist. Thank you. Vera, let's come back to you for a moment. Sure. What is information systems? That's a tough question. <laughs> information systems, um, let me break it up um, to something everybody can relate to. Technology, um, anything that involves technology. You can have technology use in there. You can have technology development there. Um, it's the pretty much the science of technology, we can say. Except it doesn't get into the design of hardware. It doesn't get into the design of circuitry or anything. We just take, take those as given. And we take them and see how we can leverage it how we can use them to make our lives better. How can we design a process around them? 
um, so we can you know make something more efficient just like the example I gave somebody is working for three hours to do the general ledger or just you know copy and paste and how can we develop something to make that process more efficient that's information systems it could be um, the, the the product itself that you're looking at um, for example my eight buttons would be an information system um, or it could be the 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 final product itself um, like the iPhone for example it could be an information system too because eventually it helps you um, keep track of all your data your contacts your emails your calendar everything so something a mechanism that helps you organize and manage your data using technology that's that's what I would say information systems is so when you teach information systems and the research that you engage in right does it typically stay in the realm of the theoretical or the technical is there a blend of it um, it depends that's the other thing with in the field of information systems it is so big you can go any direction you like you can look at the design side of it and see how you can make or develop an information system or you can say well I'm gonna take that as given and see how people use it in their own lives or how organizations use information systems and then you get into psychology um, one of the the reference disciplines I draw upon all the time is human psychology um, for example why do people use a specific technology or why would they reject it um, just last week for example I um, submitted a journal article a research article about the use of um, social logins I don't know if you're familiar with social logins now you go to a website and then you try to register with the website the website says well are you a registered user and you may say no then they give you the option to use your Facebook account or Twitter account to go into that site and maybe give an order or just provide even a comment right you go to a news site and then you say well I want to provide a comment to this news story and they say well you know first log in and then they may say you can use your Facebook account or Twitter account so my question was um, there are reports that say people don't use the social login feature and my question was why why don't people use it so you, we get into simple human psychology is it because we don't like them is it because we have privacy concerns is it because we don't know the ramifications of using those buttons so um, you can draw upon a lot of fields when you're doing research and teaching in information systems and mine are particularly um, human psychology you can also say cognitive psychology um, but that's that's what I that's what I do in my field is that a popular major at the university these days MIS is very popular um, the students don't seem to be as interested in MIS though although it is one of the hottest fields right now if you look at the job ads out there there's a lot of companies looking for MIS graduates management information systems graduates because today technology you can't do anything without technology you need to understand it you need to efficiently use it so the field itself is so relevant for organizations for our daily lives even you know when we are doing our own daily business we are just using a lot of technology from computers to smartphones everything is technology so teaching that how we can use this how we can take advantage of this um, it not only interests me but also makes the field very relevant not only for people but also for organizations from that point of view it is extremely popular from organizations point of view it's extremely popular there is a few technical courses such as coding everybody hates coding nobody likes it 
and that's why some people tend to stay away from it but it's just one part of it information systems and management information systems is not just about coding or software development it's about using technology efficiently to solve business problems organizations do it all the time so why not get into it rather than ignoring it hope that, that hope okay. that answered the question yeah, did. thank you question for dr walters uh, when you launched the new degree program at the university digital journalism and design there was question about what would happen to the traditional degree program in journalism. And as you had predicted, students would gravitate probably towards this new high-tech digital journalism degree and moving away from traditional journalism. Could you recap for us a little bit about what have been the major influences that have transformed journalism today? And why is digital journalism taking off so drastically? Well, it's interesting what you point out um, that after we started the online digital journalism program, we had very few students in the face-to-face, -face, more traditional program. But as it turned out, it wasn't that they chose the DJD, as we call the digital program, over the face-to-face -face program. We didn't cannibalize that program. It was an entirely new type of student. Um, not one student in that program the first year had considered the face-to-face -face and would not have gone to the face-to-face. -face. So that was a surprise to us. So it really begs the question, okay, what is a journalist and who is now going into journalism? It's a different subset of people that are going in. And it used to be that journalists were writers, like me. And they were bards, they were storytellers. But the journalists of the future were in many ways of the present is part bard and part geek. They're technologically savvy, they love technology, and they use technology in the service of telling stories. And it's a fascinating thing to watch how this transformation, how, how technology has changed the nature of storytelling itself. So, I brought a piece of technology here, and I bet you thought I was going to pick up this. But it's actually something, a more important piece of technology. It's called a book, the codex. This is how a story used to be told. You started at the beginning, and you read, and it even tells you, just in case you skip a page, it's numbered. This was the format. There was a beginning, there was a middle, and there was an end. That's no longer necessarily the case. Suddenly, storytelling takes place on this. And isn't it ironic that it opens up like a book? And isn't it also ironic that when you read a story, you scroll? So you go back to the type of technology before the book. But many things have now transformed the nature. I used to think it was about changing the nature of journalism but it's much deeper than that. It's the changing the whole nature of story. And it challenges the definition of what a story is. We were taught, well, a story has a theme, a plot, characters, dialogue, it has a beginning, middle, and end, it may have a peak to it, all these different elements of the story. But that's no longer necessarily the case. Now, I've written a traditional book, stories on new diseases, for example beginning, middle, and end, where mad cow disease began, how it spread, what happened, and you know, the, how it went away. But now, if I write a story, for example, or one of my students writes a story about Ebola, they can tell that story as it happens. Multiple people can tell that story. You can collaborate, and you have people different places. I know somebody or I saw somebody with Ebola. It completely dismantles the traditional structure of story. It has its great challenges because the idea of a website telling a story, it doesn't have pages as such. Yes, we call them web pages, but they're in no way um, sequential. You don't go one, two, three. You can choose where you want. 
And so it has defied the linear nature of story, which we are so comfortable with. And so the fascinating for me, thing for me and for many of our students is to be able to take the social media, be able to incorporate video imagery into story. And it used to be that video, imagery, text were different languages. You had different types of skills to produce them. Now they all speak the same language, zeros and ones. Not only can journalists talk to each other because of that, but even more fascinating, devices can speak to one another. I can easily, as many as you probably do every day, connect with satellites, right? I can also open and close my garage door. The capabilities of collaboration from near and far, of having stories of completely collapsing the lag between when something happens when you know about it has transformed the nature of story. We are trying to create journalists who love that, who understand it, are in the process of changing not only the definition of what a story is, but in the process, what journalism is. Thank you very much. Beryl. Yes. Where's your field heading? We often ask her, what's the next big thing on the horizon? And why should we care? Perfect question. Um, there are so many things going on in information systems. Um, as I mentioned earlier, it's a, it's a big field. And it uh, depends on where you are in the field, depends on what your um, research, specific research line is, the next big thing differs. Um, the, what I'm passionate about and what I'm most excited about where I am right now and what my research field is and what my teaching is, data. Um, right now what we are seeing is there is a whole bunch of technology that help us collect data. Now what do I mean by that? Um, have you heard about the activity trackers? that you kind of wear like a bracelet, wearable devices. Those devices now help us collect a lot of data that we can analyze and just make decisions for ourselves. Hey, how am I sleeping? How am I running? What type of, how many steps did I take today? How many calories did I burn today? Um, you can take those and talk with your doctor. Um, so the next big thing that I can see as far as where I am right now is the analysis of this data in terms of making decisions. Um, I, I don't know if you guys are watching basketball. I'm a, um, a, a, a fan, but I'm not that diehard fan. I kind of watch it, NBA. Um, and what I, was, what I saw in the last finals was somebody developed the technology, they looked at all the, the data points of all the players, of all the games, I don't know how many games um, they looked at, they collected the players' positions on the court, they collected data about their, um, uh, uh, the, the field that they um, attempted a goal, and their specific positions, the opponent's specific position, and they try to come up with a percentage of a goal. When a player jumps up, what is the percentage of scoring a basketball from that position on the court? How can you do this? You look at previous data, and then you try to predict future. And what I think what excites me in the future and what is innovative in my mind is imagine you are watching TV with your glasses, could be Google glasses, and these statistics are just scrolling through your eyes. Hey, is the, play, is the game is playing out? The possibility of this player scoring a goal is 80%. How cool would that be while you're watching TV? Um, I, they're right now using this technology in, in soccer fields. The coaches have Google Glass. They're watching the game, and as they're watching the game, the game statistics are scrolling through their eyes on the screen. 
while they're looking at the game. And the, the Google, Google Glass is telling them who's playing badly, who's playing well, who sh should they substitute. Um, so what I'm trying to make, uh, what I'm trying to say is, in terms of data, the availability of the data, the way we collect data, and the way we analyze data is the next big thing, for me at least, and in my field. If you collect data, even the most useless data, if you can make some sense out of it, and if you can make or use that to predict future, or something about yourself, that is, I think, cutting edge for me. I slept this much amount of time in the last month. What is wrong with me? Or is this normal? How would you capture that without those types of devices? Or my quality of sleep is such and such. You know, go talk to your doctor and see if, if it's okay or not. You know, um, Capture data about your daily activity. Go talk to your doctor and see if it's okay. Um, all of these things help us make better choices. Um, that's what excites me in the future, and that's what I see is, is really innovative. Thank you very much. Final question for Dr. Walters, and we're going to open it up to the audience. You can't help but feel the Dali presence of this fascinating museum and the innovation and creativity of the genius who is Dali. When you look at your career and your teaching and your research, to what extent has the spirit of Dali and his creativity influenced you, and where do you think that might lead you into the future? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Often, um, I will walk over here if I've been working for four or five hours, and I will you know, go up the stairs and just meander. I will do that frequently. Fortunately, we have a, we can get in for free with our USF. Um, <laughs> Otherwise, I might not be quite so casual about it. But it is so interesting, um, you know, what goes on. As I, I'm not um, an art historian, an artist, but you don't need to be to appreciate a great artist. And I think a few things. Um, it's evocative for me. I think that one thing is that we are often challenged as academics, non-academics, to get out of our, our, our comfort, comfort zones and to see things in different, disquieting, disconcerting ways. But that's what change is always about, it seems to me. And if that's what change is always about, then it would follow that that's what progress is always about. And I sometimes think that Dolly um, has the last laugh when we come through here because I think I actually call surrealism a re relative realism in the sense that what could be more surreal than walking along the bay, seeing the trees? What could be more surreal than we walk into here and we see, okay, well, that's what we call surreal that it's all surreal. It's uh, like Thich Nhat Hanh once wrote, a comparable thing would be, the miracle is not to walk on water, the miracle is to walk on green grass. In the same sense that surrealism isn't in a museum, it's all around us. And I sometimes take that as the reminder, the message. I'm, I'm pretend, pretending to be surreal, but I cannot be anywhere near as surreal as what is all around me. I think another thing that sometimes goes through my mind is that there's a hidden symmetry in peace in some of the most disturbing paintings, as there is in life. You know, that be beyond the difficulties of change and moving forward in my field or many others, there is often a symmetry behind it. And I think another thing that sometimes happens, it's, it's a metaphor, it's a lesson, it's that you can look at a painting, um, I don't know the names of them, one has to do with the bust of Voltaire, the other, um, Gala overlooking the Mediterranean Sea, is that it? Um, where you look at it 
and suddenly it becomes something else. And all those to me are important lessons and I, and I often leave with, with new ones every day. So I go back and I think, okay, it gives me a, a starting point, a freshness in which to look at what is really a disruptive, a sort of creative disruption of all that I grew up with as a journalist and the traditional things I learned that um, the oddness, the unpredictability of the paintings has really become a good friend in the middle of some difficult days. Thank you for that. Can we have a round of applause for Jean? <laughs> Now it's the best part of the show, your part. Does anybody have any questions that you would like to ask? Yes. Dr. Wallers, um, how is uh, digital journalism related to blogging, for instance? Would that be uh, a similar situation? Um, let me make sure I understand. How does it relate to? Blogging, right. Yeah. Well, blogging used to have a very bad name. That was the poor man's journalism. Um, it's if you couldn't get an audience, then you just blogged. <laughs> but now, blogs have become a respected part, for example, of the scientific literature. They are often cataloged, you know, archived as part of it. So it's become some of the best journalism is actually being done on blogs. I think it's been a tremendously liberating format for creative people who have something to say who didn't um, happen to have the fortune to work within a, a larger structure that was once required to get the word out. You no longer need to have a printing press. All you need is a computer with an internet connection. So I think it's been a vital part of journalism. Um, the Huffington Post is really very much a blog-based sort of uh, publication. And by the way, one of our very first graduates from this program is now working with the Huffington Post. But yeah, it's a, it's a question, it's a very important part of journalism in my opinion now. Thank you. Um, Merle, can you tell me what, uh, what the consequences would be, for instance, with, with your information highway in using the statistics to get uh, garner information, how this eventually is going to affect gaming, for instance? Um, you know, horse racing, stock market, all these things that are based on cumulative data. You know, it is funny you mentioned that the other day I was thinking exactly about the same thing. Um, back in Turkey, um, soccer is big. Um, we don't have American football. We call it football, which is soccer. Um, and one of the games is that you try to predict who's going to win for the week. So there are three choices. You have two opponents in a soccer game, right? You have three choices. Um, you can say one, which means the first team is going to win it. You can say two, meaning the second team is going to win it. Or you can say zero, which means it's going to be a draw. Um, when I was a little kid, uh, my dad used to play this game a lot. And he would just give us the ticket too and just say, you know, make a guess. Maybe we're, we're going to win. So my brother and I would sit and we would just go two one zero two one zero without knowing anything. Um, now I was thinking about that a couple days ago. I said, "Well, now I have the technology. I can have all the data that these two opponents played against each other. I can look at all the history, and I can look at." the maybe player psychology, the weather at the time, the, the game, the day game, uh, the uh, day of the game, and make, maybe make a better prediction. Instead of just guessing 210210, maybe I can run an algorithm on all the historical data and maybe be 90% accurate. I think that is going to happen. Um, people are already doing that sort of thing. Um, they may be running algorithms on even lottery numbers. Um, but it is more than possible. I am sure people are doing it. Um, I don't know the legality of it. Um, but it's certainly possible. Now, speaking of um, the past, would that be possible 10 years ago? Not with the current technology. Now we have super fast computers. We have super fast algorithms. 
run them through a huge data set about all the games that have been played in the past, boom, you have your answer. I have a question. Uh, I've thinking about it for quite a while. They're saying half a million, half a million apps and many other programs that are available. And yet the way somebody like me finds them, or most people find them, is happenstance. Uh, is there, is anybody thinking about a way to routinize the possibilities for somebody to use apps in their lives? Each of us has our own pattern of things. Someplace in that pile of apps is something that would be really helpful to us. And yet, in order to find them, we have to have a friend tell us, or we have to stumble on it, or do, you know, it's, it's a very, yeah, random process. And the question is, this would be more your, your uh, part of the game, I guess. Me? You. Yes. Um, would it be, is there a way of, say, uh, routinizing that to the place where you almost get a personality profile and then say, these apps would be useful to you? Well, um, I'll take a note of that and I'll see if I can develop an app. <laughs> 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 and, and start monetizing on that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> That's another good point. Now, uh, I think there are two, two, two parts to that, two, two answers to that question. One is I'm in the same boat. Um, I think a lot of us are in the same boat. We don't necessarily run into, we, we run into things today. Um, People recommend something to us and we say, oh, okay, that's a good idea. Let me just install that. Or we just check out the, the ratings, right? They are a good indicator. Sometimes the highly rated ones are the best ones. Um, the second answer to that question is about privacy. Now, there's a whole line of research about personalized services and personalization. Um, we, to some extent, want companies to personalize their offerings for us, but also we don't like it because we want to keep things private. We don't want to tell them our preferences, but also we ask them to personalize things. So there's a dilemma there, there's a paradox, and there's a whole line of research on this. Um, I think one of the solutions is finding an answer to this paradox. How can they go about keeping things private, respecting our privacy, don't sell the information to others? Because a lot of times what we see is somebody collects our preferences and we think they are going to provide some personalized services for us and the next thing you know, the information is sent to somebody else or just being sold. Um, they take advantage of our information. Um, and I think the key is finding that balance because people don't trust those types of services when they say, hey, give me your preferences so I can personalize things for you. Um, maybe Amazon does it all the time. And that brings me to the data aspect again. There's too, too much data out there that organizations can take advantage of. We get into data mining association mining actually which products go together so I download one product and then the next thing you know Apple is pushing some other products on me saying you may also like these Amazon does it all the time so some people don't like them they say hey you know why are you just pushing me all this information um, I don't want it I, I please respect my privacy and some people like you and me say hey I want to see more um, and there's, there's, a, there's, there's a balance right there and the, the one that might find the balance and the one that can keep the information private may prosper. I don't know if that answered the question. I'm just trying to clarify things because I don't even know what the right answer would be. There's privacy implications. There's usability, certainly, from our point of view, but also there's privacy implications. So, whichever you go, 
you, know, you may not be able to satisfy people. I'll come back next year and hear your solution. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I have a question for both of you. With respect to MIS, the John community, uh, you're talking about data. Uh, the sport, the, the entire sports field, has been affected by cyber metrics. You probably get that term, okay? Uh, it started with the, with the Oakland A's, the very important book. And I've been doing some of my own studies. I used to teach as well. Um, and I have a book coming out on that. Uh, the, the metrics, the term that you haven't used is the key. It's, it's called metrics. And what you have to do is not just take a lot of data, but figure out what data you really need to do to predict. Looking back, uh, historically, scouting was done in sports. They would go to a scouting team or they have people that would hire, and they say, uh, what should I do? Uh, who do I hire, who do I keep? All these, all these questions. Yeah. What has happened with cybernetics? Not, uh, that's, that's what is specific baseball. But there are variations of all of these. And there are better graphics today. We can take a look at the point that you were making in terms of taking a shot, where is the best place to take a shot, where is it mostly defended or not in basketball. Uh, I'm dealing with that in a book that I'm writing on how we out probably in a couple months. But the point is that it's changing the experience of the spectator. Okay, the spectator wants to go to have a team win, no matter what it is, okay? Even though race. But, you know, I think that's the answer. Have any problems, okay? The question is, when Joe Madden looks at that, his little piece of paper in front of him, is he using metrics? I don't think so. He's doing his information on metrics. But there are, there are teams that are doing much better because they are using metrics. And they know who to trade. Project went to Detroit, okay? And they brought a bunch of young people because they're the Rays have always been take the young guys, get them experience, hope they learn on the job, and hopefully we'll have a team. That's the Rays' philosophy. But that's not what the good teams are doing, okay? And uh, so understanding metrics, and that applies to every sport you can think of. NASCAR, Indy, I've looked at all of them, and I've done some analysis of it. And it's the key to winning. The key to winning is to understand how to predict the future. So that's one of the things, I'm just putting to make more common and we can have a question for you as well. Absolutely, you're absolutely right. If you look at, um, again, I'm going to give my examples on soccer because I pretty much follow soccer. And if you look at European um, football clubs, soccer clubs, they take advantage of data big time. They are collecting new types of data. They may not necessarily rely on what is out there. They, their teams, their coaching staff may be collecting different types of data. So they have a computer system, they enter this information after every game into the system to see who did what, what type of performance the players showed in the previous game, who needs to get more training, what type of training. And the team that does this guarantees success. Yeah, well, certain, certain players have certain characteristics. They're, they're people, you know, the enforcers, for example, in soccer. So you have to look at all these aspects. But the bottom line for management and owners is how do we win next season? How do we do better? So, uh, in a sense, it's what you call information management. That's what it is. Right. It's MIS. Right. Adapted to sports. And that's why I have a look at it. And I have a question for you. Thank you for your comment. I have a question with respect to what you call journalism. Um, I think what, you, what you're seeing in digital is, is storytelling. I don't think you're seeing journalism. I don't treat that as, as journalism. Journalism has a certain structure to it. Traditionally, okay? But you're right. Most people today are, because of the way they've been brought up, want to see that. So they want to see more pictorial information versus the kind of information that has evolved through intuitive and deductive reasoning, okay? So there is that, there is that lag. The, 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 what I'm about to say is 
What's, What's that, that going to do to our society in five years? Is it, it going to be something that can be manipulated like what happened in Germany many, many, many years ago by someone who's charismatic? Because you're not really thinking through what's happening. You're being motivated by, by images, by misinformation, by lobbying, and some other things we're talking about. And, and so it seems to me there's a challenge with respect to the digital. Now, I happen to be a believer that Amazon is the, the best thing that's happened in this country because it's taken publishers who have essentially been uh, abusing authors for years. Okay? I can speak to that. I've a number of professional books. You don't make any money out of it. You do it for professional reasons, or if you're teaching, you change a chapter every couple of years and you lose your other book and raise the price. So, there are two different things. Uh, the effect that I'm talking about is, I think digital uh, use of what Amazon's doing in their platforms, uh, I think exposes more people to want to express themselves, give them an opportunity to do that, than has been historically the case. And I was wondering if you would want to comment on that. Yeah, um, interesting, fascinating observations. Um, I, I think I would disagree that uh, journalism is different from storytelling. Um, I think that the best journalism has always been storytelling. Um, virtually all the Pulitzer Prizes, for example, um, are about good stories, about people, about motivation, about heart and soul, and not simply about information. Um, information comes and goes. Um, I think that we are probably, as a species, wired to tell stories and to remember things through stories. So I, I would think that the best journalism is about storytelling. Um, I think, well, you made a number of points on, on the, the second thing. Um, you know, what's it going to do to the future of journalism? It's lost its, if I understood you and I agree completely, in a sense it's lost its analytical or contemplative dimension because now we stream news and that enforced almost um, layer of analysis, of stepping back, of contemplation is being lost. And I wonder, I think the tipping point for journal, digital journalism is really yet to come. Some interesting studies, you would probably know more about these uh, than I would, but the effects, for example, on memory, of being able to look things up, I, um, to multitask. You know, we're constantly multitasking, um, and I wonder what, over the long term, generation or two, neurological changes, and they will be inevitable, that this sort of rapid processing of real-time information will cause, um, maybe at the expense of this lag time that, as I say, is an enforced um, contemplative or analytical dimension that we think about what happened. And um, I think it will have impacts. I don't know that they will all be bad. I'm certainly a big believer in the digital technology. I think it's improved our, our lives in innumerable ways. But I do think that's an, a question that's still outstanding. What will it do to the way we think? You know, because of the way we are now processing information so much differently than we have in the past. I just want to make one point. There's a difference between good storytelling and journalism. I mean, factually. I can speak to that. So what we really want and what the public wants is good storytelling. So what you have to do to adapt in your writing presentation is to take it to a point where you're actually talking back, giving background in a, in a simplified manner so that the reader can understand and incorporate that with his own information system. There's also the problem that we as human beings are not wired for all the information we're getting. Mm -hmm. And there's, there's a, several major articles that come out, Wall Street Journal and others, saying there's an overload in terms of the amount of information we can absorb because of our own limitations and cognitive limitations. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's, well, that's why I personally have a concern mm -hmm. about where we're going in the future. Mm -hmm. When you say digital will catch up, if it keeps going at the rate it's going, I don't know how it catches up, yeah. <laughs> unless there's a better educational base. Yeah. 
Well, somebody will soon find out, but those are just fascinating observations. Thanks. We have another question from the back. Hi there. Uh, oh, okay. Uh, I had a question. So in regards to both of you, I sense the theme of efficiency in both the reporting of the news and how humans interact with computers and also how computers are becoming more and more a part of our lives. And I want to ask a question. Do you think as we push for more and more data and everything to be synthesized into numbers nowadays, as you mentioned, the race and the chances of someone scoring, of making a goal, if everything turns into a number or percentage nowadays, does that take away from the humanity that we would have in the future? Well, um, Go ahead. Take the, I'll give the shallow answer and you give the deep one. How about that? <laughs> I don't think that'll um, be the case, but. <laughs> um, you know, it's, um, I, I think it will be a trade off. Um, I think one of the amazing overlaps that I understood from when you mentioned the next big frontier is data. Well, data driven journalism is also one of the big frontiers, you know, in my profession that we can divine or discern patterns and masses of data because of computers that we couldn't begin to see before. Um, for example, um, Google, uh, or the Centers for Disease, Disease Control and Prevention, you know, predicts flu season, when it's coming and when it's leaving. Google, on Google Trends, there was an analysis done of people searching for um, flu-like symptoms. And when they graphed the number of searches over time and compared the CCC, um, CDC chart on reports of flu cases, the uh, Google search is actually a week or two ahead in predicting. So there are incredible stories hidden in data that we're just beginning to find. You know, your question is, it goes back to one um, I used to debate uh, in college was, well, if you understand about light and refraction and wavelengths, does it make a sunset any less beautiful? <laughs> Jeez, I wish I knew. I love them both. There's nothing else much to say on that. There's nothing, nothing else much to say. But I, but, but I see your point. I don't think it's necessarily going to take the, the human element out of anything. Um, I think it's going to eventually improve the human element, um, whatever we're doing, whether it's sports, arts, or sightseeing. It, I, I'm hoping so, at least, to you know, I'm hoping that technology and data and all that innovation is going to make our experiences much better instead of removing. I, I agree. I think that as our technology moves forward, as the internet moves forward, our humanity is going to start to assume newer forms of expressing itself within this new environment that we find ourselves in, this digital world. Completely agree. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. That was so well put. It's kind of a follow-up question. Um, you talk about prediction, and prediction is terrific in certain circumstances, but at what point is the prediction could do two possible damage, negative things. One is, I'm thinking politics. Um, you predict who the winner is going to be, so everybody knows those predictions are so accurate. Why bother to go out and vote? Why bother to even participate? Because we already know who's going to be the winner. Um, and maybe that applies to sports too, I'm not sure. <laughs> um, and so I'm wondering if there's such a thing as two, and the other part of it is, at what point is the, the journal leading the way as opposed to describing what happened? So they're shaping it as opposed to actually telling the story of what already happened. So it's kind of the two, there's too, maybe too much information. Um, um, I just wanted to comment on that. Sure, um, let me take a step at it. Um, is it gonna take the fun out of things? Prediction, I think that's the, the gist of the question. So if we know who's gonna win this game, why bother even watching it? Um, there's always the, the, uh, the uh, there's always the human element. 
right there in everything. So I think the human, the presence of humans just alone um, changes the entire landscape. We can predict it as much as we want. It could be 99%. I don't think we can ever achieve 100%. The best maybe is 99%, but that doesn't mean that 1% is not going to happen. Because of the human elements, maybe the 99% is going to be just all gone and 1% is going to happen. So that's what I can think of at the top of my head right now. In terms of political predictions, um, that's a tough one to answer. You know, I, we know who's going to win. And I don't know if you heard about Iowa uh, markets. There's a market online where you can trade shares of political candidates um, every four years you know who's running for office they trade the shares of people running for office and it can predict the winner by even 0.01 percentage points it is so accurate and it can tell you who's going to win even one week before the elections and it's been tested over and over again and they said it's pretty accurate um, so based on that knowledge people are not gonna vote because they already know the answer I'm again thinking out loud there's you know yes and no I don't know um, there's again the human element that I can come up with um, in terms of political arena I can't say much, but again, maybe one of the, the candidates is going to screw up the last minute, who knows. Maybe they're going to say something that's going to upset people. There's again the human element, that's, that's what I'm thinking. When there's human element in anything we predict, there's always that little chance that things may go the other way around. As we often do with the genius next door, we go over time. And uh, this is a fabulous conversation and discussion. And what we'd like to do is to invite anybody who would like to stay a few minutes after uh, to join us out at the Gala Cafe. And our geniuses have agreed to come out and to field some further questions with you. I do know that Dr. Walters, you have to be back at the university by 7.30. But uh, all that's for you. You had a, a dog ate your home or something. Figure it out. OK. So with that, can we give our geniuses one more round? Again, it's the third Thursday of every month, so September the 18th, we will be back with the Genius Next Door. Thank you, and have a great day.